G'day, Tragic here. Oh, that's the wrong pack. What am I doing? This is the pack that we're doing. Uh, Road to Rivendell, pack two with the other hero. So, let's get into this baby, shall we? Ooh, what could it be inside? What cards of awesomeness could there be? Who knows? Who knows? Right. Okay, so we've got all that kind of stuff. And I'll just do my thing. Now, Lord of the Rings. Let's, uh, let's just talk about Lord of the Rings itself. Now, I'm planning to get the Hobbit major expansion, but at the moment, I am not planning on getting the next expansion after that, the next cycle. So I'm going to get the rest of this cycle. I'm planning to get the next Hobbit expansion. But I'm not planning at the moment to continue the next cycle after this. And why is that? Basically, I feel this game is getting to the point where it has got a lot more for me. It's, uh, it's a fun game. There's a huge variety of quests to choose from. You know, when people come over and say, oh, let's play Lord of the Rings, I have a great quantity of quests for them to pick from. I just, I'm just not sure whether there's a continual, a, a still a need for me to continually collect this anymore. We'll see. And also, Netrunner's coming out, and I want to play Netrunner. So, you know, there's going to, there's going to be a lot of, uh, just so there's just going to be a lot of cards, a lot of other card games that I want to collect. And to be quite frank, I'm starting to get very frustrated with this game. Uh, the luck factor has always been a very heavy thing, but as the player cards are getting more and more powerful, to compensate this, the encounter deck is getting more and more powerful, and the way the encounter decks are being designed is not really, in my opinion, the way to go. They're, I mean, they're getting powerful, but they're getting much more random, as in, you have no problems, and then you'll turn over a card, and that'll completely lose you the game. So the whole game, you spend all that time deck building, all that time setting up, and then you can lose the game in a single uh, flip of a card, which is extremely frustrating, especially when you're playing solo, and also when you're playing with uh, other people. You know, you play with other, other, you know, your friends come over, oh, let's play Lord of the Rings. You spend all this time, you set up, you explain the rules to them, and bang, one or two turns, game over incredibly frustrating and it's really annoying me and uh, that's why I've been feeling this like Kazadoom was fantastic I love some of the Mirkwoods and uh, I haven't really played a lot of this one but at the moment I'm starting to feel a little bit iffy about this game anyway so uh, let's let's see what we got here first we have the new hero and he is the hero that uh, combos with the hero from the last pack and his ability is the same except it's plus attack so he's got a three attack so these heroes they obviously work together and I'll show you that brother brothers in arm deck after I finish these videos very very good hero and I like them a lot next we have no be try I'm trying to go a lot quicker because my last video was like 50 minutes long it's ridiculous no one's gonna watch that so Let's try and be a little bit quicker this time. Anyway, Duodane Wanderer, Range, Sentinel, and Secrecy 3. So, pretty hardcore. It's only got a quest for one, you know, Range and Sentinel. Attacks for two, defends at two. Extremely powerful card. He does cost five, but with Secrecy 3, he only costs two. So, fantastic card. And I really see absolutely no reason to ever not play him if you're running a deck that can. He is definitely one of the cards that you will be aiming to cast if you're running Secrecy. Okay, so next we have Lure of Moria. Okay, action, ready or dwarf characters, it costs three. 
Now, I'm not a big fan of these ready or character cards. They are very helpful, but again, they're kind of tricks, which means a lot of the time they're standing in your deck dead, which means that until they have the ability to be cast, you're not really doing much with them, and I, I just find that not the kind of card that I get into. I prefer to have cards that allow you to do things. As soon as you get it, you can cast it and do it. So I like cheap cards that have cool effects. don't like conditional, and I don't like cards where you're... Uh, waiting for an opportunity. I like the opportunity to present itself in the card itself. Still, it does have its uses. If you're running a strong dwarf deck, then it is going to be quite powerful. Okay. Flip. Next is... Um... Whoop, whoop. Oh, I promised I wouldn't screw around with this. Okay, next is Rivendell Blade. Really nice little artwork here. And the Rivendell Blade is, let me read it. Attached to Noldor or Sylvian character. Restricted. Another restricted card. These are really starting to add up. Very powerful cards, but there are some already extremely good restricted cards. Is this card going to be worth playing in response? Let's have a look. When attached character attacks an enemy, that enemy gets minus two defense until the end of the phase. Okay, so that is very, very good. And you can attach it to characters as well. Uh, okay, well that is an extremely good card. And... Uh, that could very well be worth playing, actually. I am going to put that straight into my Tactics uh, Sylvian deck. I've got a Tactics Law Sylvian deck that I sometimes run when I play solo. Uh, and uh, that card is a must put in. Uh, I don't know. I, I, it's interesting. It's interesting. I think, uh, I think the problem is it is restricted and there's so many good restricted cards that it's really starting to add up and the choice of whether to run the restricted attachment or not is becoming quite heavy. And while this effect is really powerful, it's not really giving you much of a bonus. It's just sort of allowing you to bypass. It's not going to help on creatures that have low defense. But getting past those trolls, awesome card. Okay. Hail of Stones. Exhaust X characters to deal X damage to an enemy in the staging area. Well, awesome. That's a fantastic card. I love anything that can kill things in the staging area at event speed is a must-have. So, love that card. But, of course, the problem is you need a lot of uh, untappable characters. Next, we have Rider of the Mark. Okay, so this is an interesting card. I do like that. Uh... Okay, spend one spirit resource to give control of Right of the Mark to another player. Limit once per round. Response. After Right of the Mark changes control, discard a shadow card dealt to an enemy you're engaged with. Interesting. This is an interesting card. It does have... It doesn't have to tap to use its function. It's got one defense, so you can send it to another person, sort of like a uh, you know, a, a bad version of Sentinel, but it does allow you to destroy uh, your shadow cards. And it's interesting to note, after the Rider of the Mark changes control, discard a shadow card dealt to an enemy... Oh, actually, you're right. Enemy you are controlling, yeah. So it can only discard cards from uh, from you to... that, that from... Uh, I can't even speak. You can only discard shadow cards that are on attacking enemies, attacking you specifically. So that's a not as good an effect, but you'll note that they are separate. One's an action and one's a response, which means that you can you can swap even if there's no cards to swap. Okay? And even though the action's once per round, it can be cast at action speed. So this is a good thing, I mean, it costs two resources to run if you're running a split attack and quest deck. You know, you send it to the attack deck, send it away from the attack deck. So it's costs you two resources pretty much every single time you want to use it. Not the best not the best card, but has some uses. I, I think it's not nearly as powerful as people think at first glance. 
Okay, next. We have a song, a spirit song. Ooh, what is this? Spirit song. Attached to a spirit hero. Interesting. After Song of Landry enters play, draw one card. Response. After another player raises threat, raise your threat by one to reduce that player's threat by one. Okay, so... This is not what I would call a good card. It has no value for solo players. And also... It doesn't really have a lot of value for multiple players. Sure, you get to lower your threats and all that kind of stuff, but most threat reduction cards are actually able to be played upon any player in the game. So if you have all the threat cards, you can cast them on other players. And it's only one threat every time they raise their threat. So if you fail a quest, your threat goes up by 5, your threat will go up by 6, and their threat will go up by 4. It's really not that good an effect. I do not think this card is particularly good. So, there. We'll see how it runs. I, I'll, I'll try running it, but... Like I said, most of the threat reduction cards can be cast on any player, so it doesn't matter who owns it. Unless you've got a card like that, uh, I think is a hero named Bofor, uh, that every time he kills an orc, you drop your threat by two. That's one of the few threat reduction systems that is only happening to a single player. But again, most people aren't running spirits in decks that are killing things all the time. So, I don't know. I don't think that's a particularly good card. Next, we have... Bomber, or whatever. Okay, Bomber. Action. Exhaust Bomber and choose a location. That location gets minus one will until the end of phase. That location does not contribute its will instead if it's an underground location. Okay, so this is kind of like, I don't know, I guess a... Yeah, I don't like this card either. Another card I don't like. Basically, what we've got here is we have a card that we can tap and it will put minus one will on a location, or... If it happens to be an underground location, it'll completely cancel that out. It costs three, but, you know, we could just run Secret Pass, which costs a one. Difference, of course, being that this guy is an ally, which means he stays in play, and that is a powerful effect. But, I don't know, three costs, takes up an ally slot, takes up a card slot, can only work on certain locations that we'll probably never see again. It's another thing that's a bit disappointing me about this game, is like a... The continuity between quests is so separate that we, we see cards and player cards that are designed for that cycle, but we might never get to use them again because that cycle, we might never see, you know, our next, our next uh, who knows where we're going to be next, but our next uh, cycle could be set in a forest, and we might never see an underground location again, and this guy will become useless, so we'll have to see what happens to this guy, but at the moment I'm thinking... Secret Pass and other such versions. There's that uh, one cost. Uh, it's, it's also law. There's a one cost law event that puts four progress tokens. That could be just as good, if not better. Okay, so what have we got here? Another secrecy. This one says secrecy two. Action. Oops. That's not. Uh, that's not empty plastic things. Secrecy 2. Action. Search the top five cards of the encounter deck for any one non-objective card worth no victory points and add it to your victory display. Shuffle the encounter deck. Okay, so this is an interesting card. Cost secrecy 2, so it's a one cost in a proper secrecy deck. And remember, secrecy decks do have a lot of scrying. So, uh, Denethor really is a, a must-have for secrecy decks, for the encounter deck, and the Hammer Marth, and uh, Ears to the Ground. They're all lore, by the way. This is lore as well. And what this is basically allowing us to do is remove a threat completely from the game. We place it in the victory pile. We did see in the last quest uh, a card that could actually shuffle the victory pile back into play, but that's actually quite rare. I've never seen that before. So... 
again, interesting card, and it actually has a quite a good effect. But it'd be interesting to see whether... I, I have a feeling that this might be the kind of card you think is really good. You put it in your deck, you have a plan to use it, but in reality, it just sits in your hand. You know, you'll draw it in turn one, and you won't use it for the entire game. Okay, next we have... Okay, now this is a weird card. Someone explained this to me. I saw this uh, when I was updating my Lackey plugin. Response. After a dwarf character leaves play, shuffle the encounter discard pile back into the encounter deck. Why would you ever want to do this? I can only think of one quest, and that is uh, Hunt for Gollum. If, Hunt for Go if Gollum goes back in the encounter deck, you can get to shuffle it back in. But seriously, this is a really bizarre card. Going okay, back. It just seems to me, I don't know. I think there's very few situations where you want to shuffle the encounter deck back in. Maybe some will turn up later, but at the moment, not really my kind of card. I'm not really happy with that card, and that, that's it for the player. See, I'm trying to go much quicker this time. That's it for the player deck. Let's uh, zoom along, shall we? First thing we'll do, we'll do this in the correct order now. Now we'll do the quest cards. So, we have... Along the Misty Mountains. This is 20. Wow. 20 to beat. So let's have a look at uh, 1B first. Set up. Put Erwin under play on the first player. Shuffle the encounter deck. Reveal one count. Okay, so very, very simple. One card per player. Not a lot going on here. 20 to beat. Interesting. Okay, so we have a very, very simple... It's good to see a quest that's nice and simple to set up for a change. There's nothing fancy going on. 2B, we've got nothing going on in 2B, and 2A, there's nothing going on. We just have... Oh no, there is a reveal on 2B. Why? I'm, I'm mad. 2B, when revealed, search the encounter deck and discard pile for Goblin Gate and add it to the staging area, if able. Then, if there is no active location, Goblin Gate becomes the active location. Okay, so the if able is interesting. I'm not quite sure what that means. I'll have to check the card. My guess is that it has victory points, which means that it can be completely removed from the game by the time you get to 2B. Okay, so let's have a look at 3B. 3B, when revealed, reveal one card from the encounter deck per player and add it to the staging areas. Characters cannot be healed. And then we defeat this stage. So this is 13. So this is like an old-fashioned just quest and attack deck. I like it. I like... I like... Uh, like, I do like the more complicated quests. I mean, uh, the very third... The third quest in the Khaz of Doom is fantastic. But it's also good just to see something that's nice and simple. You just quest and kill and, you know, play around what monsters come out. I like this. This quest is looking like something that I would enjoy playing. Okay, so, Erwin, and she is exactly the same as last time, so nothing at all of interest going on here. Remember, she is the same name as the card that comes in Watch in the Water, so you can't use her. And she is uh, giving one resource to any hero. She's basically the same ability as Theodred. Okay, so, let's just find the Goblin Gate. Here we are. Goblin Gate. This is the one that we have to actually physically place. Physically place. When Goblin Gate is active location, the first enemy revealed from the encounter deck each round gains ambush. If that enemy engages a player, it makes an immediate attack. Deal and resolve a shadow card. Okay. So, what is ambush? And Bush. Uh What did I do with the rules? Here it is. Now, Ambush is basically just uh, an engagement check. Okay? Ambush, keyword. And if you're wondering about these, all these rule sheets are actually contained on the Fantasy Flight website. But it's basically saying that 
Uh, when an enemy with the ambush keyword enters player, each player, starting with the first player and preceding cockleyes, blah, 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 makes an engagement check. The engagement check is only made against the enemy just entering play. Okay, so it basically means you reveal a card from the encounter deck. If it has the word, if it has the word ambush, it is then engage, do an engagement check, and it will instantly go to engaging. And this card here means it will not only do that, but it will also attack. What's interesting about that, of course, is that when they engage they are not contributing threat to the staging area. So we're most likely going to see very low threat monsters. Okay, so now we have Ruined Road. Okay, so we've got Ruined Road. Okay, there's only two of them. Okay, so can we see this still? Response. After you travel to Ruin Road, the first player places two progress tokens on it and readies one hero he controls. Love this. I really I really think the travel phase is a phase that is not used as much as it could be. Uh, too many travel effects are completely negative. They, I like the idea of there being good places to go as well and adding those choices. And usually they add to this choice by... Uh, making low threat. See how this has got low threat up in the corner here? So the good good locations have low threat, bad locations have high threat. So you have to make that choice. And I like the way that provokes a player choice that affects the game. Very cool card. I like this. And the shadow effect is return attacking enemy to the staging area after it attacks, which is my most hated shadow effect. Oh my god, that warg. That warg that you just can never kill unless you have done here. <laughs> he is uh, oh, painful, painful, painful card. I hate that card. Hate it, hate it. So, here we are. I think that's a P. Pathless country, yeah? Pathless country. Forced. After at least one progress token is placed on pathless country, remove one progress token from it. Okay, so... That is an interesting effect. Shadow effect is deal one damage to each ally in play. That's really vicious. Terrible, terrible shadow effect. But the actual other effect is quite interesting as well. And one of the interesting things about it is that it negates Northern Tracker. It negates Shadowborn Scout. Basically, every two progress tokens you place, you only place one. So you want to try and beat this quest in a single go. You want to put six progress tokens on it in one go or four progress tokens, and actually, which actually counts as three. You don't want to just just make the questing. Interesting card. I really like this card. I think it's a, a very, very good location. I like it a lot. I don't like its shadow effect. That's uh, That scares me. But uh, interesting card. That's uh, So far, that's the most interesting card, I think, from the set that I've seen, that I go, yes, awesome. I like it. High Contender. We'll probably be seeing that again. Okay, and we have the Barren Hills. While Barren Hills is the active location, ignore Ambush. Another really good location card. Shadow, return attacking enemy to the staging area after it attacks. Again, my most hated shadow effect. But uh, Barren Hills, interesting, interesting card. This allows you to ignore ambushes and, you know... There are a number of cards, which I've not really played much with, that allow you to swap the active location with other locations. And this could be the kind of card, and there's also this attachment coming up soon, and I think it's the pack after, it's the pack after the Long Dark, the next one after this. There's a new attachment coming, which uh, has an effect while it's on the active location. So being able to switch cards in and out of the active location could become a major gameplay element, and that sounds quite exciting to me. Okay, next we have Sleeping Sentry. Okay, so there should be two of these. Nice. Okay, so Sleeping Sentry. I should probably not put the plastic on before I read it out. 
When revealed, deal one damage to each exhausted character, then exhaust all ready characters. Okay, so this is basically like a necromancer's pass with a little extra stuff on it. And shadow, defending player must discard all exhausted characters he controls. Whoa, it's pretty heavy. <laughs> Okay, so now we have Followed by Night, another treachery card. When revealed, the first player choose one, deals one damage to all allies in play, and followed by Night Ganger's Surge, or all enemies engage with player make an immediate attack if able. Okay, another cool card, and again, open to debate, but there are plenty of treachery effects that do not trigger if the requirements are not met. You know, like if you draw a card that says remove all progress tokens from the quest card and you've got no progress tokens, the quest card does nothing. This has a choice. So if you have no enemies engage with the player, choose option two and the card actually does nothing. It'll just fizzle out. There are some people who say, well, if you can't choose if you don't have players engaged, you are forced to choose one. I don't particularly agree with that. Okay. Yunk. Orc Ambush. Surge. When revealed, all orc enemies in the staging area engage the first player. If there are no orc enemies in the staging area, return all orc enemies in the encounter discard. Oh my god! In the encounter discard pile to the staging area, if able. Okay, that's a pretty interesting card. So it either you either get a big attack, or you get a huge adding to the staging area. Now. That's an interesting card. It gets Surge as well. It's a very, very cool card. I can't wait to see that in action. I haven't actually played this quest. That, that sounds extremely exciting. Very cool card. I like that card a lot. So basically, you either... You best, the best time to cast that card is when there's no enemies in the stage one enemy in the staging area is the best time one orc in the staging area is the best time to get that card okay so here's our first ambush character goblin taskmaster he has 27 2 2 2 4 forced after goblin taskmaster engages a player that player deals two damage to one character he controls okay And he does an engagement check, and he's at 27, which means he's pretty much going to be instantly engaging anybody who is not in secrecy. So, interesting card. I'll have to see how that runs. I can't really see this as being too much of a problem. You do have to hit him for six, and, whoa, there's quite a few of them. What are we on, three now? I guess there's five of these, no, four. Okay, so this is one of those cards, I don't know, like, it doesn't sound very threatening, but like, if he's uh, doing engagement checks instantly, you could very well find yourself fighting a whole bunch of these before you even know it. Okay, and next we have Orc Raiders. Okay, Forced, after Orc Raiders engages a player, that player discards two attachments he controls. Okay, so that is a lot worse. I mean, two damage on a character wasn't bad enough. When he engages, we now have discard two attachments. Now, discarding attachments. Let's just talk about discarding attachments for a while. So people think this is the be end or end all. It's like a terrible, terrible thing. And it is bad, don't get me wrong. But... There's quite a few. I think there's three cards now. There's Ember Hammersmith. There's uh, Second Breakfast. And I believe there's a new one. I can't remember off the top of my head. I'll have to go check it out. But I think there's a new one that also allows you to return attachments from the graveyard. 
What I'm trying to say is that there are ways to get your attachments back, and there are actually attachments which you want to be discarded. And what I mean by that is, say Horn of Gondor. You cast it on someone, they get a few resources, you're expecting a discard attachment. You can actually plan for that, and I have got decks that are designed to swap the position of Steward of Gondor. So you have Steward of Gondor on one to get out some cards, and then when the attachment discard attachment comes up, you go, cool, you discard attachment, bring it back, cast it on another person, on a different hero, and use his resource to get out, say, high-cost questers after you've got out your defenders and blockers. You know, so there are tactics where you can make the encounter deck work for you. And attachment discarding is really one of them, because it allows you to play around with unique cards, unique attachments that you cannot really cast more than once, allows you to cast them on multiple heroes in a way. You just have to be careful with the way you pilot the deck. Uh, okay, so this one is... I uh, can't even pronounce that. Brand, some kind of bird. It's got Surge again, and while it is in the staging area, encounter card effects cannot be counted. Shadow, return attacking enemy to the staging area. Okay, so... That is a pretty bad card. It's easy to kill. It's only got three. And no defense. So you can kill it in pretty much one go, if you're attacking with Dun here, or if you're... You just engage, and it, it attacks for zero. It does get a shadow card when it attacks, even though it's attacking for zero, by the way. So, interesting card. It's mainly there for the staging area effect to stop you from being able to cancel things. Okay, and here's the big sucker for this quest. Some big scary bear. I actually think bears are really, really cute, even though they're huge. Wild Bear. He's kind of cute. Big fat so, except for his teeth. They've got those little ears. Come on, they're cute. Okay, so, Wild Bear and Ambush. He's got Ambush. He had defense of 5, attacks of 3, attacks of 2, defense of 3. So, you've got to hit him for 8 to kill him in one go. And forced, after Wild Bear engages a player, it makes an immediate attack. Okay, so... It's got a 34 threat. This isn't this isn't a particularly scary card. I mean, it's not a, it's not like a, a wussy card, but this isn't freaking me out. And that is it. Now, I'm sorry if I went a little bit fast that time, but my last video went for like like almost an hour. <laughs> so I'm trying, I tried to make this one a little quicker. Wow, look at my desk is so messy. Okay, I'm going to clean up after this. Let's have a look here. What is a good card here. Hmm. Well, you know, I really think this is a very weak pack for player cards. I mean, obviously the heroes are always powerful, so I don't want to pick heroes unless they're ridiculously powerful. So I'm going to go with the... Rivendell Blade as a really good powerful card definitely going to try running that and best art I'm going to go with the Goblin Gate I saw that before I just love this don't see a lot of red in uh, in Lord of the Rings for some reason I mean well there's red here but normally you don't see a lot of red in uh Lord of the Rings, and I think, uh, I just love this card, I love the way it's got the, you know, I like all these cards that have sort of cracks leading somewhere, just like the Goblin Gate, awesome, and my favourite card is actually uh, this one, this Orc Ambush, fantastic card, I think that's going to be very, very exciting, and that's going to be a lot of groaning and moaning, and oh my god, complete game changer when it comes out, awesome card. Okay, so I hope that went a little bit quicker this time. And I will see you for the last one left. And then I'm going to clean my desk.